TMZ TV. You are definitely going to want to check out yesterday's Rodney Paris Martin Sender 1 2 Puncheroo. It is a recording from 1999. Myself and five other believers in a radio station, largest radio station in Cleveland, Ohio, WCCD 1000 AM. We've been running a series on Eternal Torment Week. Yes, that's right. We dedicated one week to undoing the heinous false teaching of eternal torment that depends upon bad translations to even be remotely presented as true. Of course, it's absolutely not true. But yesterday, I mean, I haven't listened to these shows in 20 years. These shows were recorded 23 years ago. And a guy called in. This was live radio, call-in radio. And a guy called in by the name of Bob. His name was Bob. And boy, was he mad at us. He called us a cult. He called us false teachers. He said we were playing with words. He says we didn't believe God. I mean, this guy brought out everything against us. But the word of God stood strong because we weren't, we weren't promoting ourselves. We were promoting the word of God and a correctly translated scripture. And when you have a correctly translated scripture, the false teaching of eternal torment disappears. Uh, and I really, as I watch this, I listened to it again. I really felt sorry for this Bob guy, and I was wondering, I wonder what he's doing today. And I wish I could tell you that I know the guy's last name, and I pursued him. No, I don't know what he's doing today, but uh, I pray for him. I pray for this guy because, man, he, you know, he's locked up in the classic Christian stubbornness. So go to that video. If you haven't seen it already, I'll link it below. It's the Wednesday show from... Uh, July, I think July of 1999. And uh, it's a good one to send to other people because, as I said, it gives it a legitimacy because we're on Christian radio. And yet yeah, our, our producer, Ricardo, is getting more and more impatient with us. He's getting more and more nervous. He more and more wishes we would go away. But we had a contract. Well, I've had a contract with two other radio stations, one in Chicago and one in Indianapolis, and they both kicked me out, Dan Sheridan, and I got kicked out of radio stations. So contracts don't generally stop these people once they figure out what you're teaching. But anyway, that's that. On Friday, I appreciate all your comments on Friday's show. I really like that show myself. Um, I got tears watching it also. It's just powerful, and it shocks me all over again every day just how pervasive the deception is and then when you realize that god himself is enabling the deception god himself is sending the deception and we saw that in first kings chapter 22 when we get a behind the scenes look at the workings of god where in a nutshell god dispatches a spirit from his throne room to be a deceiving spirit, a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets of Israel and Judah. Yeah, the prophets of Israel and Judah, there were 400 of them. Watch Friday's show, show 1033, if you haven't heard this yet. And they were all prophesying that the king should go up against, against Ramoth Gilead, one of Israel's former possessions that she wanted back. Yes, go up, they all said. They spoke as one, go up, go up. But at the time this is happening, we don't know why they're saying that. We just think they're all a bunch of sycophants. They're all just sucking up to the kings, and they're all trying to say the same thing because they love popularity, not truth. Well, we find out from a look behind the scenes via Micaiah, one of the despised prophets who always tell the truth. Oh, the Christians and the Pharisees of the old days, they can't stand people to tell the truth. We get a behind-the-scenes look of why those prophets were saying a wrong thing. Let me give you a little uh, preemptive strike on that. Israel falls at Ramoth Gilead. I mean, practically speaking, they shouldn't have gone to war because it was stacked against them. They're going to get get creamed, but God wanted them to get creamed. For some reason, I don't know why, but God knows why. So he sent a deceiving spirit in the mouths of the prophets. In other words, these prophets were not diabolical enough to to all prophesy the same thing, and they're acting not on the Spirit of God. We know now that they're acting on the whim of a, of a, of a lying spirit. Now, just like Pharaoh. Pharaoh was not stubborn enough to let the Israelites go after all those plagues. After the frogs, he's ready to send them out. 
After the frogs, he's had it. I need no more frogs. Let the people go. And then just when the people got ready to go, he hardened his heart because God hardened it. That's why he hardened it, because God hardened it. Pharaoh wasn't sufficiently stubborn. And the, the, the 400 prophets of Israel and Judah were not sufficiently uh, uninformed, not sufficiently unspiritual to prophesy all the wrong things. So God sent a lying spirit. Now, this, of course, blows up the teaching of those who insist to us that God would not do anything bad. He sure wouldn't send a lying spirit. God is all about the truth. Yes, God is all about the truth. Well, this has nothing to do with the truth. The truth is the truth. This has to do with God's plans, God enacting his will upon the earth, and God needs bad things to happen. He needs his son to be crucified, for instance. He needs Saul the Pharisee to become a, a great man, quote, unquote, in the Pharisaic world so that he can be changed. How do you change a guy from bad to good if he's not first bad? So God makes bad stuff happen constantly. But we have these people who are so delicate, so uh, offended to hear that God would be anything except flowers and cinnamon and aloe and rose petals and uh, Chanel number no. five oil of Oleno. God would never have anything to do with, say, dog poop or meatloaf, you know, or a Joel Osteen sermon. No, God would never have. But we know that that's not the case. God's plan requires hard things to happen. And so he himself sends a lying spirit. You got to read it to believe it. First Kings chapter 22. And here's what I'm going to read to you from the Greek scriptures. You got to hear this to believe it. I know you've heard this before, but as always, I got new insight into this. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 6. And now you are aware what is detaining for him to be unveiled in his own era. The him of this context is a man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, who Paul has been speaking about uh, beginning in chapter 2. Now, the, the man of lawlessness, the only thing preventing him from being publicly brought forward as that man of lawlessness is our presence. We're the detainer. We keep the man of lawlessness from being unveiled in his own era. And as you and I believe, this is the era, and we are very close to him being unveiled. And so for him to be unveiled, we have to be gone. We're the detainer. We have to be coming out of the midst. And we all believe, I believe still, of course, that this is about to happen. And then Paul goes on. We get another uh, intimate, intellectual truthful look at what's happening paul says for the secret of lawlessness is already operating for those of you who don't know what the secret of lawlessness is it is this that lawlessness today is disguised as righteousness that's the secret and it takes people who are made aware of the secret who are brought into the confidence of god and told that psst, if it looks good it's probably not good if it's popular it's probably rotten to the core because I am now bringing the worst evil to the earth, the most ungodly, sinful things under the guise of light, under the guise of righteousness. It's the old whitewash tomb effect, whitewash, the guise of righteousness, uh, messengers of Satan posing as apostles of Christ. It's all false, false, false. And so really, this is going on all throughout the scriptures with God presenting one thing. And you can say it's a trick. I mean, I'm not even, I'm not against saying that it's a trick for the people, but God needs this to happen. And the only way it can happen is if he inspires it to happen. God doesn't take chances. He doesn't hope something happens. So that's the secret of lawlessness and the secret of lawlessness will prevail and it's been prevailing since the time of paul since the death of christ christianity became an official religion in the fourth century and so it's an entirely false front all the christians it's all false it's all false the religion is false it's the most lawless set of beliefs on the planet earth i mean eternal torment really 
that the human will is more powerful than God's lawlessness, lawlessness, and it has produced lawlessness by those who have the stupidity or the temerity, whatever it takes to believe it. But it's disguised as, why don't you join our wonderful organization? Okay, that's the secret of lawlessness. Now, that's going to be going on until the time that uh, that man of lawlessness is unveiled. Then there's going to be no more filter. There's going to be no more righteous presentation. It's just like the left in this country now, right? I'm in the United States right now. I'm at the edge of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula. It used to be that the communists were just right, were, were, were hid, hid their plans, hid their agenda behind pleasant sounding phrases. Well, I guess they're still doing that. They call themselves progressives now. <laughs> what a misnomer that is. I'm a progressive. Oh, you believe in tyranny? centralized government that lords it over all the other people. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a progressive. What a joke. What a joke. But besides that, they're now becoming more plain, more obvious about what they want and how they want to get it. So once the man of lawlessness gets that midpoint of the tribulation, possibly even before, lawlessness is going to not be disguised anymore. So that's the secret of lawlessness. And not many people know this. Because so many people are influenced by the looks of things. Of course, the outward appearance, the smell, the looks, the, as Paul writes in Ephesians, the systematizing of the deception. People love systems. So the secret of lawlessness is already operating. It was already operating in Paul's day. It's on overdrive today. Only when the present detainer, here it is, may be coming out of the midst, then will be unveiled the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus will dispatch with the spirit of his mouth and will discard by the advent of his presence. Whose presence, the man of lawlessness, is in accord with the operation of Satan. This is how it looks today. Get ready. The operation of Satan with all power and signs and false miracles and with every seduction of injustice among those who are perishing, that is, who are not going to have Aeonian life, who are not chosen before the disruption of the world to be in the body of Christ and to therefore live through the eons, those who are perishing, why are they perishing? Here it is. This is the relative viewpoint, but get ready for it because they do not receive the love of the truth. They don't receive it, right? What do we have that we have not received? Paul writes that to us what do we have that we haven't received nothing we've received grace and we've received the truth and we've been disabused of the lies but however some people have not received the love of the truth and you got to feel sorry for them they haven't received it god has not given it to them instead god gives them deception he dishes deception out to them and almost all the people you know who named the name of God, not including members of the body of Christ, of course, are of this ilk, of this body of people who are constantly deceived. They constantly believe every lie of Satan that comes down the pike. Listen to this Bob guy yesterday. He believes every single lie of Satan. Every single one. Here comes Satan, bringing lies one after the other. Bob just swallows them down. Gulp, gulp, like Pac-Man. Eating the lies. You got another lie? Bring it to me. Boom. But the lie is dressed up and poses as the truth. And it's dispensed by people who are squeaky clean, like Joel Osteen, or socially accepted wonder people like Billy Graham was. This is how the poison pill is delivered to the system, by pretty people in large cathedrals with great organizations. And... Those who are, have no love for the truth, even though they swear to God that they do, they buy this stuff, they buy this crap off the counter as soon as they can be put on the counter. All power, <clears throat> false miracles, every seduction of injustice among those who are perishing because they do not receive the love of the truth for their salvation. This proves that they're not saved. I'm sorry, but here it is. This proves that those who are believing these lies are not saved. And we're not talking about worldly people. We're talking about Christian people. Because only in the Christian world, only in the religious world, is the secret of lawlessness operating. Only in that world 
is lawlessness disguised as righteousness. Religion is the greatest cloak evil ever had. You don't see that in the world. You don't see that among the drug dealers or the car jackers. They're, they're, they're like obviously evil and they don't care and they talk all like, I won't jack me a car. You know, it's just, there's no hiding it. They don't care to hide it. They're shady and they love to be shady. They like to look shady. And therefore, God will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood. This is exactly what we were seeing Friday in 1 Kings chapter 22. So we're looking on the stage at the action on the stage. Oh, these people do not receive the love of the truth for their salvation. Um, they're, they're believing things in accord with the operation of Satan because they love signs and miracles. Never mind that they're false signs and false miracles. They don't care as long as it's a sign and a miracle. God will be sending them. This is actually looking back at why they're like this. You might be, you might say, well, no, Martin, because it says God will be sending them an operation of deception. Yes, but listen to what follows. God will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood. So this goes back to why they are believing the falsehood, why they're believing false miracles, why they're being seduced with injustice. And by the way, eternal torment is the most unjust doctrine there is. That God would take people who are locked up in stubbornness, which is everybody, take people who are not able to call out to God, in whom there is no righteousness whatsoever, Romans chapter 3, and because they somehow can't work their way out of it, send them to hell for eternity. That's unjust. But what does it say concerning these people? They are in accord with the seduction of injustice among those who are perishing. And again, this can be none other than the Christian world. And the reason this is happening is because God sent them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood that all may be judged. What? Judged? Listen, that all may be judged who do not believe the truth but delight in injustice. See, I just told you these people delight in injustice, and there it is. They delight in the doctrine of eternal torment. But God is the one sending the operation of deception that they may be judged. But wait a minute. Why would God judge people that he himself brought the deception to and people who had no other choice but to believe the deception because God made it so sweet, so good looking? How could he judge them? Well, if you ask this question, you've just put yourself in the place of the objector of Romans chapter 9 who says, well, since God makes vessels of honor and dishonor, how can he judge how can he judge vessels of dishonor? How can he judge people who he makes hard? See, Paul says, who are you to question God? As I always told you, God has a problem. He has a problem in that he does everything. So he has to judge people who he makes hard because nobody's hard or stubborn apart from him. Nobody can do anything independently of him. Free will is the independence of the human from God. You get down to it, that's the nasty inside definition inside and outside, if you ask me, of human free will, independence from God. But nobody can do anything independently of God. So nobody can be stubborn. Nobody can be good. Nobody can come out of stubbornness, I, sh I should say. So when you remember that judging is for the good of the person being judged, then and we can relax a little bit. So, okay, God does judges them for their benefit. But this comes right back, doesn't it, to Romans chapter 9, the vessels of honor and the vessels of dishonor. We have received from God the love of the truth. Why? Because God did not send us an operation of falsehood for us to believe the lie. If he had have done that, if he had, had have done that to us, we would have been like these people who are perishing. Because there's no difference between our flesh and theirs. Because these vessels of honor and dishonor come from the same lump of clay. This is God doing it from start to finish. The only reason, the only reason we love the truth is because we have received 
the love of the truth. The only, peop the only reason these other people, the mass, vast hordes of Christianity, don't receive, don't believe the truth is because they haven't received from God the love of the truth. It's not their fault, but God still judges them. And we can legitimately still criticize them. For if not, how could we expose, rebuke, and entreat as Paul charges Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 4 2? Expose, rebuke, and entreat. Well, why would I expose or rebuke somebody who can't help but being stubborn? See, that's a fatalistic question. I get it all the time. I get it all the time. Martin, why are you so critical of the Christians? They can only be what they are. Again, that's like asking me, Martin, God's the one who sends the rain. Why do you use your windshield wipers? Uh, what does God sending the rain have to do with the fact that I have to get the rain off my windshield? And what does God making, making people stubborn have to do with me exposing stubbornness in the religious world so that I could then, I mean, I don't just do that for the heck of it. I do it so that those people watching can get truth, can get truth at their rebuke and exposure of the stubborn one. We don't live in a fatalistic world. We teach and herald as if people's salvation depends on us. Relatively speaking, it does. Because God uses us. Absolutely speaking, it's all of God, of course. But the shock here, and again, it's hard for me to get over it. <clears throat> I'm shocked over and over again at the fact that God is behind all this. God is doing it. It's an amazing work. And he's doing it. He's making these people hard and stubborn to the truth so that we might shine that we might be noticed, that we might be shown to be qualified. Because as Paul says in another place, there must be sects among you, that those who are qualified may be becoming apparent among you. It's all about contrast. So in a way, we can thank God for these stubborn people because it's only because of them that it is seen and it is known that God has indeed brought us out of the stubbornness and that we have been chosen, thank God, as vessels of honor.